Hey, good evening, Grace Baptist Church. I'm thankful to be with you tonight um, to do the monthly teaching from our Statement of Faith. This past Sunday was the first Sunday of the month. Uh, typically on the first Sunday of the month, we either do the Statement of Faith or the Covenant Statement. And this past Sunday should have been our Statement of Faith. And instead of reading the entire Statement of Faith, I'm going to focus in on one point, And that is our Statement of Christology as we have our teaching from tonight. So let me read that statement to you, uh, the statement about the doctrine of Christ. And then I want to focus in on one phrase in that, in that statement. We believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God who added a fully human nature to his divine nature, thus becoming the God-man, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross as the substitute for sinners, paying the penalty of God's wrath against sin, rose from the dead, and will come again to establish his kingdom on this earth. There you have the statement of faith, and obviously, if you're looking at the title of the presentation tonight, I'm going to focus in on the virgin birth of Christ. Right there in the middle, really, I guess the, the front third of that statement, uh, we write that a person must believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And so as a church, we believe this is very, very important. Uh, and really, our faith rises or falls on this. When we talk about why virgin birth, the fact of the matter is this. If the virgin birth is a lie or a myth, then we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. Let me read that again, and please take this in. If the virgin birth is a lie or a myth, then we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins. Throughout, throughout the centuries, people have uh, thought that the virgin birth was simply a nice story, a nice way to bring about the birth of Christ. Uh, and they'd admit that he's a very extremely important person in history, that really history changed uh, at, his advent, at his advent. Um, they would agree with that, but they would think that, no, a virgin birth is just not something that they can go along with. That really kind of rises uh, to the level of a miracle, and they don't believe in miracles. Somebody like that was a guy named Thomas Jefferson, uh, very familiar to you, the President of the United States, uh, and he also penned the Declaration of Independence. He was a secular humanist. He was, in some senses, a deist. Um, but he wrote this, he says, The day will come when the mystical generation of Jesus by the Supreme Being as his father in the womb of a virgin will be classed with the fable of the generation of Minerva in the brain of Jupiter. And so there, Thomas Jefferson, uh, he sets uh, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ there right alongside the myth mythology of old from the Greeks and the Romans. And that's all Jesus Christ's birth is, is uh, his virgin birth, is, is nothing but another myth. Well, Thomas Jefferson obviously isn't the only one throughout history. Uh, pretty much anybody without the Spirit of God in them who's thinking uh, is going to deny the virgin birth. Uh, even theologians, even people who've been trained, and this, this gentleman here is a Swiss Roman Catholic theologian who... Basically, the Roman Catholic Church said, uh, see you later, because this guy was denying papal infallibility, and he didn't believe in, uh, you know, the, the Pope really had as much power as they were giving him. And Hans Jung uh, wrote this. He says, although the virgin birth cannot be understood as a historical biological event, it can be regarded as a meaningful symbol, at least for that time, right? So he denies the historicity of the account there in the Gospels, that it's impossible that it was actually history, but it's a symbol, that it merely is a symbol of, of God wanting to interact with the world and that he would do that supernaturally. Another person uh, that you might be surprised to know denied the virgin birth is Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, for all the, his great accomplishments, his commitment to civil rights, his great sacrifice, obviously, in giving his life uh, for civil rights. He said many great things, but the fact of the matter is that he didn't believe the Bible was inerrant. He didn't believe uh, in, in, in uh, the fundamentals of the faith. He didn't believe in the virgin birth. Uh, he didn't even believe in the you know substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, but he says this about the virgin birth. He says the evidence for the virgin birth is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. So there you go. It's uh, you know, there, anybody who thinks rationally is not going to believe in the virgin birth, really. And that kind of places Martin Luther King Jr. into the realm of secular humanism. Um, and he believed in the love of God, that we need to love God, love our neighbor. But that just wasn't based uh, in, in the biblical Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. Larry King, uh, he's interviewed many uh, theologians, many pastors and uh, 
preachers uh, in his day. Um, and one day he was being interviewed himself by uh, Ravi Zacharias International Ministries. And they asked him a question, hey, if you were to arrive in heaven, you saw Jesus, uh, what's the one question you would ask him? And, and Larry King didn't have, he didn't even hesitate. He said, I would like to ask Jesus if he was indeed virgin born. The answer to that question would define history for me. And that is so true. Uh, whether or not Jesus Christ was born of a virgin really does matter in history. All of history is defined by it because if he was born of a virgin, that gives a lot more significance to his life than people want to give. Well, as we consider the virgin birth, we have to understand that the Bible clearly teaches the virgin birth of Jesus Christ as a fact. Matthew and Luke don't, they don't mess around. I mean, they, they just state it as fact. They don't give a lot of explanation. They don't give rationale for it. They just record it as fact. The Bible clearly teaches the virgin birth of Jesus Christ as fact. And really, as I've said already, the Christian faith rises and falls on the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. If there's no virgin birth, then we have no faith. We have no salvation. And so it's important for us to stand by this doctrine. This is not something that we can just say is kind of a not so important, you know, I'm, you know, let's, let's focus on the major things and not so much on the minor things and that the virgin birth really isn't that big deal. No, it is a big deal, friends. And that's why I teach on it every year. I think every year we need to rehearse this. Uh, we need to review this as a body of believers. And we need to cling to this doctrine, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. One commentator says this, he says, the virgin birth is an underlying assumption of everything the Bible says about Jesus. To throw out the virgin birth is to reject Christ's deity, the accuracy and the authority of scripture, and a host of other related doctrines that are at the heart of the Christian faith. No issue is more important than the virgin birth to our understanding of who Jesus Christ is, what his nature is as being fully God and fully man. If we deny Jesus is God, we have denied the very essence of Christianity. So as we look at the concept of a virgin birth, we're going to look at Matthew 1, 18 through 25. I'm going to read the passage, make a few brief comments, and then I'm going to give us four reasons why uh, the virgin birth is a theological necessity. So let me pray, um, ask God's spirit to, to work in us, and then let's look at this text. Father, we thank you. Uh, for the gospel writers, particularly, I guess, today for Matthew and Luke, and that, that you worked in and through them to record this account of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And, and Father, I pray that you give us understanding now. Help us to um, understand how, how important it is uh, that the nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ, is dependent upon it. And that we need to hold on to it as believers. We need to cling to this doctrine because our very salvation is at stake. So, Father, please give us understanding now in Jesus' name. Amen. So, why a virgin birth? Matthew 1, 18 through 25. First, we see that the, the virgin birth is announced. Verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Well, let me just say at the outset, this pledging really uh, is a very legal binding contract between a man and a woman. The two families would come together, uh, and if this contract was to be broken, it was it was uh, tantamount to a divorce. So his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they became before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly, right? So we see how, how binding this betrothal period is, that if you were going to break it off, it was, it was like a divorce. And Joseph understood uh, that he needed to protect Mary. He was a righteous man. He understood that the, yeah, the penalty for adultery, and in his mind, in Joseph's mind, Mary, if she's pregnant now, and she's committed adultery, she has been unfaithful, um, and the, the penalty for that is, is death by stoning um, and disgrace to the families. And so uh, Joseph didn't want to do that to her. And so he was going to divorce her quietly. But here we see the virgin birth is announced right there at the end of 18, that she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. That's, that's key there. Verse 20, and we see here the birth is validated by an angel. Right, the angel tells us that in fact Mary has been, uh, she is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but after he, Joseph, had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, 
Joseph, your son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. There we see it again. The conception occurred not through the normal procreative process, but that she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so the angel comes to say, hey, Joseph, look, don't fret, don't get upset, don't divorce her. Look, she's telling you the truth. She has conceived by the Holy Spirit. And you're going to call this young man, you're going to call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Well, Matthew wants us to understand that this is something new. That in fact, in the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet, uh, basically in judgment over the nation of Judah, um, gives a sign uh, to Ahaz that a virgin is going to conceive. And I believe that this relates specifically to the birth of Christ. Really, if you read the Isaiah prophecy, there's no virgin in view. I mean, there's nothing in the context that tells us who that virgin is immediately. So I, I think we're led to believe that Isaiah is making a, a promise there in Isaiah 7 to the house of David. And that house of David extends here even to the one who's descended from David, Jesus. And so in verse 22 of chapter uh, 1, we read this. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So he has the name Jesus. Uh, God will save his people from his sins, but he's also called Emmanuel, God with us. So he's going to be God in the flesh. And there, there we have it. Well, that's the crux of the matter. This one born of Mary truly is the Son of God uh, who took on a human nature to become fully God and fully man. It's so key and so important for us to understand as we look at the doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Well, the passage continues and we see that Joseph believes this concept of the virgin birth, that he's been given faith through the message of the angel. In verse 20, 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded and he took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. There you go. Uh, that's the story. That's the story of the virgin birth. It's just stated as fact. And key to that is twice in the passage there, um, Joseph is told that what Mary has conceived, the one Mary has conceived, has, has been accomplished by the Holy Spirit, and, and that she's going to give birth to a son. Uh, his name will be Jesus. God saves his people. His name will be Emmanuel, God with us. So as we consider the virgin birth, there's four things that I want us to, to understand, uh, four reasons why the virgin birth of Jesus is a theological necessity. One, the virgin birth protects the veracity of the scriptures. Two, the virgin birth makes it possible for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. Three, the virgin birth protects the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. And four, the virgin birth makes our salvation possible. Really, number four really is just kind of the result of or, or um, what, what is possible because of uh, the virgin birth. So the first point there, the virgin birth protects the veracity of the scriptures. When I use the word veracity, I mean the truthfulness of the scriptures, that the Bible's not lying, that when, when Matthew and Luke recorded um, the fact that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he's telling the truth there, that, that they are telling the truth. Uh, and that's important, right? Because if they tell a lie at the onset of their gospel accounts, right? If Matthew and Luke both choose to include the virgin birth in their gospel accounts and they put it at the very beginning, why would you believe anything after what they have spoken about the virgin birth if you believe that's a lie, right? Because is there anything else that's true, right? And so a guy like Thomas Jefferson, he denies the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and he came up with his own Bible. And basically what he did was he cut out every part of the Bible that he didn't think was true or couldn't be rationally uh, understood, and he came up with his own Bible, the Jefferson Bible. So the virgin birth protects the veracity of the scriptures is so important for us to understand that we can't pick and choose what we're going to believe in the Bible, that we have to use our brain. We have to think through it. We need to do proper exegesis and using proper proper interpretive tools. Uh, but in the end, uh, God God's word is true. It's God breathed and we need to take it literally. 
So that's the first point. The virgin birth protects the veracity of the scriptures. The second point I like us to understand is this: the virgin birth makes possible, makes it possible for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. This is extremely important. Um, apart from the virgin birth, Jesus Christ could not be fully God and fully man. The virgin birth made possible the uniting of full deity and full humanity in one person. Jesus, to be an adequate Savior, to be a satisfactory Savior, needed to be fully God and fully man. And I'll explain why this is important later. The virgin birth was the means God used to send his Son into the world. Right, The Son of God existed eternally. Uh, and in eternity past, the, the Son of God has always been. But at just the right time, God sent forth his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. So uh, the Son of God came and uh, in the incarnation, he took on a human nature, right? So as we think of Jesus coming to the earth, uh, really two scenarios could probably be uh, visualized here or thought of. And one is that God could have just sent his son into the world. He could have descended from the heavens and, and, and stepped down onto the earth and and he could have lived among us, right? But as he lived among us, people would have thought, well, he's fully God. He's God. He's supernatural. He's not a man, right? But God didn't choose to do that. It'd be very hard for us uh, to understand how Jesus could possibly relate to us uh, because he didn't descend from Adam like we did. He's not a human like we are. Well, on the other hand, uh, it could have been entirely possible for God to have Jesus come into the world with two human parents, both a father and a mother. And with his full divine nature, miraculously united to his human nature at some point in his early life. But then it would have been hard for us to understand how Jesus being born like that to two earthly parents, um, how he could really be God. If he was just, you know, as the scriptures say, isn't that Joseph's son? Isn't that Mary's son? Doesn't he have brothers and sisters, right? So one commentator says this. When we think of these two possibilities, uh, the ones I just mentioned, it helps us to understand how God in his wisdom ordained a combination of human and divine influence in the birth of Christ so that his full humanity would be evident to us from the fact of his ordinary human birth from a mother, and his full deity would be evident from the fact of his conception in Mary's womb by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. So Galatians 4 says this, but when the time, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive the adoption to sonship right there. And key in the passage is that God sent forth his son. God sent his son into the world. And his son, uh, at that moment of, of conception, as the Holy Spirit over, uh, overshadowed Mary, and she conceived, the son took on a human nature. Fully God, fully man, this one born of Mary, born of a virgin. Well, the third reason why I think that uh, the virgin birth is a theological necessity is that it protects the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth, birth protects the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. You know, all human beings that are born um, have a sin nature, and we're born with that. I don't need to convince anybody uh, of the fact that, that people are sinful. Some people want to deny that, but it's... That's just them denying what is what is true. Right? We're all sinful. We see that by people's actions. And, it, you know, we look at babies. You don't have to teach a baby to do wrong. They just do it naturally. And why is that? That is because they are born sinners, right? The scriptures tell us that all who are born of, you know, earthly mother and father, uh, they are, are born in sin. Psalm 51, uh, I believe verse 3 tells us that. And so all humans have inherited legal guilt and corrupt moral natures, from their first father, Adam. Okay, we inherited this from Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they fell, all of those born to them inherited, okay, a sinful nature. We call that original sin. The fact that Jesus didn't have an earthly father means that the line of the descent from Adam is partially interrupted, right? That sin that's passed on was interrupted because, at, because Joseph didn't, uh, cause Jesus to be born. The Holy Spirit did, right? 
So Jesus did not descend from Adam in exactly the same way in which every other human being has descended from Adam. All right, and so we understand that this um, breaks that 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 line of corruption. So there's a passage that, that tell, talks about this, and that's uh, Luke 1:35. And Luke 1:35 says this: The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God, right? So the one born of Mary didn't have any sin. Why? Because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said that he is going to be holy and he's going to be called the Son of God. So Luke 1.35 connects this virgin birth, this connection by the uh, conception by the Holy Spirit, with the holiness and moral purity of Christ. Okay, and reflection on that allows us to understand that through the absence of a human father, Jesus was not fully descended from Adam, and that this break in the line of descent was the method that God used to bring about. The fact that Jesus, yet fully human, did not share an inherited sin from Adam. Well, the question comes up, what about Mary, right? Because he came from Mary. He has a human nature, right? So the, the Roman Catholic Church, they to get around that, what they say is that there was this immaculate conception. Now, when we talk about the immaculate conception of Jesus Christ, we're not talking about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary and her conceiving. What the Roman Catholic Church believes in the Immaculate Conception uh, to get around Mary's sin nature is that she didn't have a sin nature. That in fact, Mary lived an entirely sinless life. Yes, that is the doctrine of the Catholic Church. That is the, the taught doctrine. And let me read it to you, okay? I'm going to read to you from the, the Catholic doctrine. Pope Pius the ninth proclaimed the most holy Virgin Mary was in the first moment of her conception in view of the merits of Jesus Christ preserved free from all stain of sin. All right, one great uh, Roman Catholic theologian Ludwig Ott um, says this. He says the Catholic Church teaches that in consequence of a special privilege of grace from God, Mary was free from every personal sin during her whole life. Now, um, that's wrong on so many levels, but first of all, Mary was a sinner, right? In her Magnificat, she declares her need for a Savior. Mary did, in fact, die. We don't die unless we have sin, all right? There's no physical death apart from sin, so Mary did have sin, but God... In his providence, in his supernatural power, he circumvented the normal procreative process through the Holy Spirit, thereby sparing Jesus Christ of sin. Okay, the virgin birth protects the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. And this is very important, right? Because if Jesus were a sinner, then he would have deserved to die, and he would not have been a substitute that's a, a satisfactory substitute for us. And so really that leads us to the last point here. That the virgin birth makes our salvation possible. The virgin birth makes our salvation possible. Since, and, and I want you to think about this, Hebrews chapter 2 um, talks about uh, the nature of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to explain to you the fact that Jesus Christ is fully human and that he's fully God, all right? And we need both of those to have a satisfactory Savior, right? We need a substitute like us to die for us in our place, right? There is a like-for-like like substitute that's necessary. The wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die in the place of human beings, okay? And and Christ, as a, as a man, as being fully human, did meet that need for us. And Hebrews chapter 2 relates this to us. Hebrews chapter 2 talks about the humanity of Christ. As the author of Hebrews launches out on teaching us how how Christ is greater than the angels. He's greater than Moses. But even in his greatness, God, God condescended in sending his son as a man, right? And so Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, we read this. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Jesus, shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. He goes on. For surely it is not the angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Right? He's already talked about the angels in the passage. 
Okay, and he, he mentions Abraham's descendants, uh, and that would be the children of Israel, the Hebrews, uh, and then we get lumped in there as well. Verse 17, for this reason, Jesus had to be made like them, like humans, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. Right, we're told here that Jesus had to be fully human so that he could be a satisfactory sacrifice in our place. When Jesus died on the cross, he was paying the penalty for our sins. As a human being, he was dying in our place, and he had lived a sinless life. He, he had fulfilled all the stipulations of the law, right? We read in, in Galatians chapter 4 that, that God sent his son, born of a woman, under the law, and that's important because under the law, Jesus, being sinless, fulfilled all the requirements of the law. And then he even went on to fulfill our requirements in the law and the punishment for the law. And that he, he died and he took the punishment for all the times that we broke the law. And he did so to make atonement for the sins of the people. So he had to be fully human, Hebrews chapter 2 says. But he's also fully God, right? Because as we consider our sin, one sin against an infinite and holy God takes on an infinite punishment, right? And, and a human being can't die for another human being to pay the penalty for the sins of that person because A, that person's going to be sin a sinner, and B, that person is created. They're not God. Only God can ultimately satisfy the demands of of the law, the penalty of the law for all people, right? And in First John, we read this, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And in verse two, it says this, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. The only way that the whole world can have their sins atoned for. And that world, I don't want to get caught up in that. If you think the world just includes different types of people, hey, that's what you believe, fine. You know, I believe it's the entire world. Uh, but that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. And only God can do that. And Jesus could only do that if he's fully God and he's fully man. And that's only possible because of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. So as we consider the virgin birth once again this year in 2020, we remember that it is theologically necessary that our faith depends on it. The virgin birth protects the veracity of the scriptures. The virgin birth makes it possible for Jesus to be fully God and fully man. The virgin birth protects the sinlessness of Jesus Christ. And number four, the virgin birth makes our salvation possible. Again, the virgin birth is an underlying assumption of everything the Bible says about Jesus. To throw out the virgin birth is to reject Christ's deity, the, the accuracy, and the authority of Scripture, and a whole host of other related doctrines that are the heart of the Christian faith. No issue is more important than the virgin birth to our understanding of who Jesus is, fully God and fully man. If we deny Jesus is God, we have denied the very essence of Christianity. Friends, if the virgin birth is a lie or a myth, then we are dead in our trespasses and sins. But praise God, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died in our place, in our place on the cross, and he rose again on the third day to give us the hope of eternal life. Amen. Well, let me pray and give thanks to God for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. And let me pray for you as well, that God would continue to, to work in your life this week, to grow you in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me just encourage you to be in the Word, continue to read your Bible, continue to pray. Pray for, pray for the church, please, in this very difficult time during the COVID crisis. The church needs to be strengthened. And let's not waste these days, but ask God to give us wisdom and how what he's doing now is going to further the cause of the gospel and build up the church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ and all that that means to us. Father, please help us to have great faith and confidence in what the scriptures teach about that and help us to remember that our faith is dependent upon the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Father, please strengthen the church. Father, make us people of the word. Make us people of prayer. And Lord, as we consider this difficult time during the COVID crisis and how we 
I guess, really are kind of hampered in our gospel witness in some ways. Uh, Lord, help us not to squander the days and just put things on hold, but help us to pray and ask you for wisdom and how we can continue uh, to be salt and light in the world, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ in spite of what's going on around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.